The regression line is simply a line that best fits the data. But let's step back and talk about regression in general, and then we'll clarify what we mean by best fitting. Now, regression in general is a statistical technique for finding the best fitting line for a set of data. And the result of that is simply called a regression line. Now, line is in scare quotes here because regression applies to many different types of models and they don't necessarily have to be straight lines. We can do regression with curved lines or with planes. So regression as a technique is just a way of fitting a best fitting model. Now, what we just did before was an example of simple linear regression. So simple linear regression is a procedure for finding the best fitting straight line for a set of data using a single predictor variable. In our previous example, that was just the number of hours studying. Now the result is called the linear regression line, a straight line that best fits a set of data. Now all the linear models we've seen so far were mean structure models. So we were trying to, in the interior component, capture mean differences between groups. But now our x-axis is actually something quantitative. So rather than talking about group differences, we will be trying to model the relation between our variables. In essence, how much does an additional hour of study really get us on average in terms of the final percentage? So in our model, the part of our model that captures the treatment effect will have to be sensitive to the location on the x-axis for each individual. So let's actually work with our treatment effect first, and then we'll build out the rest of the model. Now, as I just mentioned, our treatment effect has to be sensitive to where on the x-axis an individual is. So, our model will pay attention to the x sub i. x here is just our x variable, our predictor variable, and i, of course, refers to just which individual we're talking about. So, Tom has an x sub i equal to 11. Tom studied 11 hours, so his value for x sub i will simply be 11. Now, that's just the location on the x-axis for our individual. That's how our model will actually work with the data on the x-axis. But the part of our model that captures the effect is known as beta 1. This is commonly called just the slope of our model, or the regression coefficient. Coefficient just means something that we're multiplying by something else. And so beta 1 here is the effect of studying on the outcome variable. Now notice how this is going to work. Beta 1 is multiplied by the x sub i. So for every unit increase in x sub i, we'll have one more unit of beta 1, whatever that unit is. We'll come back to that in just a second, but let's build out the rest of our model. So far, we have the treatment effect, but we also are gonna have, in essence, a grand mean. It's gonna look a little different in a one predictor regression model, but in this case, we call it beta 0. And this is known as the y-intercept. This is how much of the outcome variable you have when you have zero of the predictor. Notice that if xi were equal to zero, the treatment or the red part of our model would simply drop out. So the only thing our model would have left is the y-intercept. So the y-intercept is literally where this line will hit the y-axis. Finally, our model will have the final two components, the score on y on the left-hand side and individual error the degree to which individuals differ from whatever is predicted by the model. So let me break out this red section so we have two separate components. First, the effect in our model, beta 1, and the score on x for the ith individual. Now before we take a closer look at each of these model terms, note that this is our population model. When we take sample data and we try to make an estimate of this population model, we won't be using betas. Instead, our model will be written as the yi, the score on y for the ith individual, is equal to b sub 0 plus b sub 1, our slope, multiplied by x sub i, the score on x for the ith individual, plus e sub i. So let's actually take a closer look at each of these components with our small sample of data. First, the yi's. So this is the score on y for the ith individual. So literally, the height of each of these points in terms of the y-axis. Next, let's look at the score on x for each individual. This is simply where those individual observations are on the x-axis, so 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11. Next, we have the y-intercept. Now this is where the line actually hits the y-axis. Notice that when x sub i is equal to zero, b sub 1 times x sub i will be 0. 
Anything multiplied by zero is simply zero. So this model will predict when an individual has zero of the actual x variable, the y-intercept. So again, just where this line will hit the y-axis. Finally, b sub 1, or the slope in our model, is how much more of y we have for every one unit of x. So let me actually draw in one unit of x here, so five to six hours, and notice that the line is higher by a particular amount. In fact, if I draw to the left, our line is higher by the amount of b1. That's simply what that model term does. For every one more hour of study, this line will be higher by the amount of b1. Also notice that the effect of our variable is the same no matter where we are on the x-axis. That's what it means for this model to be linear. The effect is to increase b1 for every one unit of x no matter where on x we are. That's why this line doesn't curve. Finally, the error in our model, the e sub i, is simply the difference between each of these points and the line of fit. In essence, the line is predicting for each individual a certain amount of final percentage. Now there's nothing that says that individuals have to have exactly that amount, so there will be variation around the line, and those are the e sub i's. And so the error in our model is actually a pretty important component. Just like before, the e sub i's are formed on the basis of a residual, a difference between an individual's actual score, the yi, minus the predicted score, the y hat i. So just like our previous linear models, it's simply a model deviation. How much do individuals differ from what is predicted for them? Now previously, what was predicted for each person was an individual's group mean. In this case, we're predicting for an individual a point on this line. So error is still the same concept, but it's simply deviations from a line when we're talking about a regression model, where in a mean structure model is deviation from a group mean. So this is our one predictor linear regression model. It just states that the score on y for the ith individual in our data set will be equal to some y-intercept plus b sub 1, the slope or with the component that captures the effect, multiplied by how much of x an individual has, then finally plus error, the degree to which an individual differs from this best fitting line. Now let me take away e sub i for a second and notice that we're left with just the predicted score on y for the ith individual. In essence, this is just our formula for the line itself. The line is completely defined on the basis of these two parameters, the y-intercept, where the line starts when x is zero, plus how much we increment the line up in y for every one unit of x. That is the slope multiplied by how much of x an individual has. So this is the mathematical model for a line, but we haven't yet talked about how we'll be estimating what b sub zero and b sub one is. That is, how will we form this prediction on the basis of the sample data we have? Now I've said it a few times, but we want to make the best fitting line, a line that goes through these points in some way that we consider best. But what is best fitting can have many different definitions. It could be a line that never underestimates any observation or never overestimates an observation. So we need to be clear statistically by what we mean about best fitting. And I'll tell you, a best fitting line, at least if we're trying to make an inference about a population, should be a line that gives us parameters, an estimate for b sub 0 and b sub 1, that best estimates beta sub 0 and beta sub 1. Remember, if we're using our sample to make a guess about a relationship in the population, we want to make sure that our estimates, our b sub 0 and b sub 1, are unbiased. That is, on average, we'll get estimates of those population parameters that aren't over or underestimating the true values. So best fitting here should really be forming unbiased estimates of beta 0 and beta 1. And it turns out that this was a fairly tricky problem for a long time and it was something solved by someone we met before.